Yeshua prophesied that there would be just one sign of his authenticity, one sign from heaven that he was the prophet of whom Moses prophesied, the true Messiah. That one sign is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Yeshua said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so he would be three days and three nights in the grave and raised from the dead on the third day. The Jonah Code is Yeshua's most repeated prophetic statement in the Gospels and the most ignored prophecy in the history of Christendom. But it is no wonder, Einstein himself could not get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning. This is the greatest story never told. It's all about Yeshua, the prophet, the promised Messiah. Join me here in the land of Israel as we take a chronological and archeological journey through the Gospels. You have never seen anything like this before. I'm Michael Rood, prepare for a rude awakening. Twenty years ago, I walked into the Jaffa Gate pondering how I was going to survive for the next 40 days. I had arrived in Jerusalem four days earlier and checked into Petra Hostel, which was now the rundown building where General Allenby set up his headquarters in 1917. I walked through that gate with $10 in my pocket. My room was broken into the previous day and nearly everything was stolen except for a single $10 bill folded up in my return plane ticket, set 40 days into the future. Fortunately, I had paid for my room in advance, so I had a place to stay for the next two weeks, but I was uncertain how I would eat. An Orthodox rabbi in a long black coat and dusty borsalino approached me with a handbill without saying a word. The headline on the half sheet of paper read, $10,000 reward to any Christian who can answer these 10 questions from the Christian Bible. How providential, I thought. I could really use $10,000 right now. I sat down on the wall in front of David Citadel and began to decipher the 10 statements. My hopes for a quick 10 grand were dashed when I realized these questions were undoubtedly written by Jewish lawyers who had no intention of handing out bundles of cash to visiting strangers. The questions were obviously authored by those who are very aware of the problems in the English Bible. It was also clear that the purpose of the reward was to pose questions that would effectively shut the mouths of the Christians who come to Israel to convert Jews. The question? Show from the Christian Bible that Jesus is any relative of King David. First, we need to understand that our evidence must stand up in a court of law, not unsubstantiated theories of seminary professors. I needed evidence that would put 10 grand in my pocket or I don't eat for the next 40 days. Secondly, we must recognize that the Messiah, coming from the loins of King David, was not only a requirement established by the Hebrew prophets, it was an eternal promise made by the Almighty to King David. In Psalm 132, 11, Yehovah has sworn truth to David. He will not turn from it. From the fruit of thy body will I set up thy throne. 2 Samuel 7, 12. Thus saith Yehovah Tsevaot to David, when your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, I will set up and will establish your kingdom from the seed which shall proceed out of your bowels. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Second Chronicles 13.5. By a covenant of salt, Yehovah gave the kingdom of Israel to David, to him and to his sons forever. Jeremiah 23.5. Behold, the days come, saith Yehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, 
a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Boring as they may seem to the casual reader, there is a reason for the seemingly endless chapters of begottens in the Bible. But genealogical proofs are paramount to inheritance claims. In this genealogy is the claim to the throne of King David. Yeshua is called the son of David by numerous individuals, including Matthew and several demon-possessed social outcasts, but that is not proof that he is the son of David. The Messiah must be the son of David. It is not a figure of speech, but rather a messianic expectation and legal requirement based on ancient prophecies. In Matthew chapter one, verse 20, we read from the King James Version, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. It is true that Joseph, the espoused husband of Miriam, is the son of David, but Yosef is not related to Jesus. Matthew tells us that Yeshua was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that Yosef was Yeshua's supposed father. In Luke 3, verse 23, we read, Jesus himself began, speaking of beginning his ministry, being about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Yosef, which was the son of Eli. Yosef ben Eli, the supposed father of Yeshua, is directly related to King David. His lineage goes back to David's son Natan, and then all the way back to Adam. But being the supposed father of Yeshua does not prove anything. An unrelated adopted son is neither from the bowels nor the fruit of the body of the adopting father's ancestors. Luke is actually a text that proves that Yeshua is not the offspring of King David. Stop. I know what you're thinking if you have attended a Gentile Christian seminary. Your professors told you that Luke details Mary's lineage. That is nonsense. Read the text in any language. Miriam is neither mentioned nor implied. In a court of law, you could only prove what the text says. In English, Greek, and Aramaic, it says that the supposed father of Yeshua was a man named Yosef, who descended from Eli, who descended from Natan, the son of David. Luke records the lineage of Yosef, the supposed father of Yeshua, Miriam's husband. Furthermore, what anyone supposed or assumed is immaterial to the case. If you were taught that Luke was Mary's lineage, it is because there is no lineage of Yeshua to King David in the modern Christian Bible. Hence, the $10,000 reward. It took me 17 years and a lot more than $10,000 to find the answer. Stay with me. The book of Matthew contains the only other genealogy in the Gospels. If the answer cannot be found here, Yeshua cannot be the Messiah. As Luke establishes the chronological order of events in Yeshua's ministry, he states that Yosef ben Eli, Miriam's husband, was the supposed father of Yeshua. The word supposed is in itself an interesting story. Yosef and Miriam were espoused to each other. To break that bond requires a get, a bill of divorcement. Before they came together as husband and wife, Miriam was told that she would become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and that an elderly relative living in a distant village was six months pregnant. Miriam hastily assembled a travel party and made a week-long cross-country journey to the hill country of Judea, where the word of the angel was miraculously confirmed. 
Miriam stayed with Elisheva for three months and then returned home, three months pregnant. When Yosef found out, he intended to divorce her, but being instructed by the angel, Yosef named the child Yeshua and raised him as his stepson. Everyone in the village of Netzeret supposed that Yosef and Miriam got together before her road trip. The rumor of his illegitimacy followed Yeshua into his adult life. In one of his many heated confrontations with the Pharisees, they derided him, we be not born of fornication, clearly implying that he was. The book of Matthew contains the only other genealogy in the Gospels. If the answer cannot be found here, Yeshua cannot be the Messiah. In Matthew 1.1 of the King James Version, we read, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The word book is not what we picture today. This is a codex. What Matthew wrote was a scroll, like this Torah scroll, but smaller. It was written by a Levite, a trained scribe. It was penned on the hides of sheep, and he wrote it in Hebrew. This fact is attested to by the historians of the first four centuries. It is Matthew's genealogy that claims that Yeshua is the Messiah, the son of David. At the close of Matthew's genealogy, verse 17 states, so all the generations from Avram to David are 14 generations. And from David until the exile into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the exile into Babylon unto Messiah are 14 generations. This numeric linguistic device, three sets of 14 generations, ensures that nothing can be either added or subtracted from the text without announcing the error. It is an internal masora or fence around the information that protects it from intentional tampering or careless mistranslation. Verses two through six detail the lineage from Avram to King David. This lineage can be checked against the Torah and Ketuvim, the other ancient Hebrew writings. There are exactly 14 generations from Avram to David. Verses six through 11 detail the lineage from David to the exile into Babylon. This lineage can also be checked against the Ketuvim. As stated, there are exactly 14 generations. Verses 12 through 16 detail the generations from the exile into Babylon until the Messiah. But when we check this lineage against the Ketuvim, we see that three kings are missing from the lineage. Why? The internal Masorah states that there are three sets of 14. Not every generation is named, but every generation that is named is counted. If all the generations were named, there would be 17 generations in the third set. But in checking the Ketuvim, we see that the ancestral lineage to King David is intact, and that is the point of the lineage. This omission of generations is common in the Hebrew scriptures. Matthew is not breaking any rules. In Zechariah 1.1, Zechariah is listed as the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet. But in the book of Ezra, Zechariah is listed as the son of Edo, completely omitting the generation of his father, Berechiah. This omission emphasizes that Zechariah was in the lineage of a recognized prophet. This is not an error but a common linguistic device in the Hebrew scriptures that is employed when the full genealogy appears elsewhere. The book of Esther tells us that Mordecai was the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. More than 400 years of ancestry are deliberately bypassed because the point of the lineage is to show the relationship of Mordecai the Jew to King Saul's disobedience in not executing the Amalekite King Agag and his family. 
Saul's name is expunged from the lineage. Saul's father's Kish was not at fault. Saul's son Shimei was not at fault for the eventual rise of Haman, the Agagite, to exterminate the Jews. Just as with the lineage of Mordecai back to Kish in the book of Esther, the internal fence in the book of Matthew was erected by a holy man of God who was moved by the Holy Spirit to do so. The Almighty knew that the lineage would be tampered with and any discrepancy would be obvious in any language into which Matthew's record was translated, if the reader could count to 14. Now, in verse 12, abbreviated. After they were exiled to Babylon, Yechonyahu begat Shaltiel, who begat Zerubbabel, who begat Avihud, who begat Eliakim, who begat Azur, who begat Zadok, who begat Yachin, who begat Elihud, who begat Elazar, who begat Matan, who begat Yaakov, and Yaakov begat Yosef, the husband of Miriam, of whom was born Yeshua, who is called Messiah. Counting the generations listed, we find that Yaakov is the 11th generation, making his son Yosef the 12th generation. Yosef, being the husband of Miriam, is in the same generation. Miriam is the mother of Yeshua, making Yeshua the 13th generation. It is impossible to squeeze out more. Again, according to the genealogies in the Christian Bible, Yeshua is not related to King David and is not a legal heir to the throne and therefore cannot be the Messiah. But we've discovered another problem. Matthew cannot count to 14, or can he? We will need to dig deeper than is allowed by an English translation of a Greek translation of an Aramaic translation of a book that Matthew originally wrote in the Hebrew language. Eusebius. Pantanaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Cyril, Epiphanius, Arrhenius, Origen, and Jerome, early church historians of the second to fourth century all concurred with the statement of Papias, John's disciple. Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew language and several did their best to translate it. The Greek version of the book of Matthew was translated from secondary Aramaic manuscripts. Aramaic phrases remain intact in the body of the Greek text. Also, Greek quotations are not from the Greek Septuagint, but loose translations from the Aramaic. The Aramaic paraphrases quotations from the Tanakh, while the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew's Gospel contains verbatim quotes from the Hebrew Scriptures. Most of the indecipherable constructions in the Greek text of Matthew are simple Hebrew figures of speech that could not be accurately reflected by the Greek language or culture. To get to the $10,000 reward, we will need to dig deeper than is allowed by an English translation of a Greek translation of an Aramaic translation of a book that Matthew originally wrote in the Hebrew language. The ancient Hebrew Matthew allows us to correct the mathematical and genealogical errors that crept into the modern text. Because of the other problems that exist in the Greek version of Matthew, I went to Hebrew University scholar Nehemia Gordon to assist me in textual research that was outside of my field of expertise. In the course of his investigation, Nehemia Gordon discovered 14 manuscripts of the ancient Hebrew Matthew in the covert archives of Jewish scribes, texts that were unknown to the Christian world. Over a 10-year period, Nehemia has located a total of 28 manuscripts of the ancient Hebrew Matthew, and two of the oldest extant manuscripts contain the genealogy of Yeshua. Both of these handwritten manuscripts clearly read, Yaakov begat Yosef, the father of Miriam, 
of whom was born Yeshua, who is called Messiah. Yosef of V, Miriam. Yosef, the father of Miriam. Yaakov is the 11th generation. His son, Yosef, the 12th generation. Miriam, his daughter, the 13th, and Yeshua, Miriam's son, the 14th generation. It turns out that Matthew can count to 14. It was clear, even in the English text of the Gospels, that Yosef ben Yaakov, mentioned in Matthew 1.16, and Yosef ben Eli, cited in Luke 3.23, were two different men with two distinct genealogical lines back to King David. Yet they both bear a very common Israelite name. Yosef ben Eli has three grandfathers by the same name. And for Miriam to marry a man who happens to have the same name as her father is rather common. Now, with the ancient Hebrew Matthew, we have the genealogy of Miriam bat Yosef, Yeshua's only earthly parent. We have exactly 14 generations from Yeshua to the carrying away into Babylon. We have Yeshua as the direct descendant of David through the king line of Solomon. And finally, Yeshua is the legal heir to the throne of his great grandfather, David. Now, after 17 years, I have secured the final answer to the $10,000 challenge, and I have photographs of the manuscripts in my hand. 20 years after I took on the $10,000 challenge, I went up to Jerusalem to meet with the rabbi. I told him that it took me an entire week to answer nine of the questions, and it took me 17 years to answer the 10th, as I waved the chronological gospels in my hand. At the end of our conversation, I admitted that I could not collect on the reward. The proof was not in the Christian Bible. It was only in the Hebrew Matthew, which had been secreted away in the covert archives of Jewish scribes for untold centuries. But I really didn't care about the money. I had the manuscript proof that Yeshua is the direct descendant of King David and legal heir to the throne. The rabbi said, I have got to read your book. This is the greatest screenplay ever written. It is a true story. It is his story. It is the greatest story never told.